Revelations chapter 2, uh, the first five verses of chapter 2, and then I'm going to jump over to Mark chapter 3, and I'm going to read the first five verses of Mark. I'm going to read Revelations chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 1, and then I'm going to read Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Uh, I'm going to read the NIV. When it comes to Revelation chapter 2, I'm going to read the NIV. And in Mark, I'm going to read the New King James Version. Pastor, why do you read different versions? I just, different versions just give me different words that I like, different phrases that I like. Some different versions contain a picture. How many of you, you grew up on the King James Version of the Bible? And uh, you said, thou art, thou art real. Is that what you said? Thou art me? Thou art, thou art is it? You know, I was raised on the King James Version. And uh, I remember the day somebody introduced me to the NIV Bible. And uh, my grandfather almost threw that Bible across the wall. He said, he said, that's cheating, that's cheating, that's cheating. If, if the Lord don't interpret it for you, it ain't really interpreted. You know what I mean? If he, so when the message Bible came out, oh, God, oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. It was like the Lord is my homeboy. I shall not want anything. And my grandfather said, no, 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 no. And uh, so... I'm going to read uh, the, the NIV and then the NKJV. Y'all ready to go to work? Y'all ready to get going? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Y'all going to behave up here? Y'all going to behave? Y'all going to do it? Y'all supposed to. <laughs> All right. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. It says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered. You have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent. And do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Bump your neighbor and say, I'm sick of this church. I'm sick of this church. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, it says, And he entered the synagogue again, and a man who was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, if you got a Bible, underline that. He looked at them with anger. Come on, say I'm sick of this church. He looked at them with anger. Always watch in Scripture where you see Jesus get angry. Almost a few times where the text will say he got angry, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. The title of my message today is Back Like I Never Left. Do me a favor, look at the person next to you and say, I'm back like I never left. Come on, tell the other person next to you. Say, look at me now. Come on now, look at me now. Uh -uh. Look at me now. Come on, say, I'm back like I never left. Father, I pray that you open up our eyes and our ears. May we receive a word that will change and transform our lives forevermore. Hide me behind your cross. Let your voice be louder than mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say. Everybody say. Back like I never left. Uh, I'm, I'm not too old, but I'm also not too young. But I am at the age now where I can literally walk into a room to go get something and then totally forget why I ever walked in that room in the first place. Is there anybody willing to admit that you sometimes can literally in a split second, you can get up from sitting down, walk into a room, only to get into the room and totally forget why you went in there in the first place? I mean, just looking around, waiting for the thing that you're supposed to be looking for to look for you. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was you, it was you, it was you. That's what I wanted. Uh, it's possible that you can just forget stuff. There's a story of an elderly couple, 
and the elderly couple was sitting in the house, and uh, the wife, she wanted a bowl of ice cream. And so she told her husband, uh, she said, uh, sweetie, can you go to the kitchen and get me a bowl of ice cream? He said, sweetie, I got it. Uh, she said, can you please write it down? Because we both know how forgetful you are. He said, I don't need to write it down. Bowl of ice cream. I got it. She said, yeah, but I want you to put some whipped cream on top of the ice cream. He said, bowl of ice cream, whipped cream. I got it. She said, no, write it down because we both know how forgetful you are. And uh, he said, no, I got it. She said, yeah, but I want a cherry on top. And so he said, okay, bowl of ice cream, whipped cream, cherry. He, she said, write it down. Hey, write it down. He said, no, I don't need to write it down. Ice cream, whipped cream, cherry, I'm good. She said, all right. He goes into the kitchen. He's in the kitchen for 45 minutes. <laughs> when he comes back from the kitchen, he hands her a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> and she looked at the plate and said, see, I knew it. I knew you were going to do that. You forgot the toast. <laughs> Y'all catch it? Did that go over your head or did you? Because we both know how forgetful you are. Ultimately, what I'm saying is that it is possible to start out doing something and forget why you're doing it. Oh, I love to see married couples who are on their anniversary, they post their wedding day pictures, and they look totally different than the way they look right now. And you can tell that on their wedding day, they were so excited, but now it's 10 years later, and they forgot why they did it in the first place. It is possible for you to be in a career, halfway through your career, say, why am I doing this? I can't stand kids. Do I like kids? I don't know why I work with kids. Why am I doing this? What's happening? It is possible for you to start out in church, going to church for a good reason, going to church for, and then somewhere along the line, you forgot why you started coming to church. You forgot why you gave your life to the Lord. It is possible that you just forget in the book of Revelation. In the chapter that we read, Jesus is speaking to seven churches. He's speaking to the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamum, the church of Thyatira, the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia, and the church of Laodicea. At this point, he's talking to the church of Ephesus, and he's commending them for their hard work. He's commending them for their great labor. He's commending them for the standards and the principles they live by, but he, but he says, this thing you have forgot, you forgot your first love. You forgot why you started doing this. You forgot the relationship with me. You are doing all of these works, but we don't really have no connection because you have forgotten your first love. You forgot why you got into it. It is possible to be a church that misses the mark of why you started doing it. We are in a series right now called I'm Sick of This Church, and the premise of this series is for me to tell you that it's possible to be a church that's not totally on purpose to be doing church, but not fulfilling the mission that God has for you. It is possible to have great services, a great organ. It's possible for you to be getting your shout out, doing all that stuff, and totally missing what God has established for you to do. And you can literally turn the heart of God. You can turn the stomach of God. Last week, we read about the lukewarm church where he said, I tasted your warm water and spit you up out my mouth. It made my stomach sick when I tasted what the church was doing because it was off the mark for what I called it. But thank God you go to Union Church. Because here at Union Church, we have concretized our call. We have settled on what we're called to do. We, our mission is to unite people with purpose. I am literally performing a wedding every week. I am the preacher standing on the stage. And you are standing right here next to me. If you're a gentleman, then you are uh, the, the, the gentleman that's standing there, you're the groom. And, and opening the door is your purpose. And purpose is walking down the aisle. And it is my job to unite you with your purpose. Maybe you are the, 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 the young lady who's walking down the aisle. Your purpose is standing right next to me. You're supposed to come down here and say, yep, I'm supposed to join you and purpose together. You are supposed to live a life where everything God destined for you, you have. You're supposed to live a life that all the potential that the Lord put on the inside. My job is to make sure you don't die here full. That when you leave this earth, you leave empty. Because you gave everything you were supposed to give, you tapped into everything God called you to do, and you left here knowing your purpose and why you were here. How we do that, though, is we put you on a spiritual journey. 
There are four steps to our spiritual journey. They're going to put it right there on the screen. These are the four things we do as a church. We do four things. We get people to know God. We get people to find freedom, to discover purpose, and to make a difference. If you go to this church and they ask you what they're doing over at Union, man, what, what, what kind of band do they got? What kind of thing? That's not what we do. Know God. Find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. That's my prayer for every person in this room. By the way, it takes a lifetime to do that. You can't do this in nine months. You can't do this in one year. You can't do this in two years. If we're not trying to be the fly church that's just here, we hot now, and then we going tomorrow. No, we, we in this for the long run. We're trying to establish a life where you get to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And by the way, if you ever get to a place where you say, look, I know God, I'm free, I got my purpose, I'm making a difference. What's, what is, what's next for me, Pastor? What's next is for you to help somebody else know God. Help somebody else find freedom. Help somebody else discover purpose. Help somebody else make a difference. And the cycle continues on and on and on. So last week, each week, I'm going to touch on one of the things that we do. Last week, we talked about know God. Today, I want to deal with this idea of finding freedom. You can take that down. Finding freedom. I want everybody to know God. But after you know God, you got to find freedom. It is God's will for you to walk in freedom. Pastor, what do you mean by freedom? I mean spiritually free. Freedom from bondage, freedom from addiction, freedom from shame and guilt, freedom from your past mistakes and mess ups, freedom from who you used to be. I want you to be spiritually free, financially free, relationally free. Free, come on, Jada. I want you to live a life, no entanglements. I want you to live an entanglement free life. Push your neighbor and say, He's talking to you, not me. You should really pay attention. I want you free from all bondage. But, Pastor, I'm saved. I'm already saved. Aren't I free? I'm saved. No. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get, let, let me just go ahead and, y'all know I'm going to step on a toe, Pastor. Let me go ahead and step on some toes. It is possible to be saved and still bound. Saved means you believe in Jesus, you believe he died and rose again, and now you are free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, right? But so, so that means you're going to heaven. Heaven is good. You and heaven are good. Here's your problem. You got 50 more years maybe on this earth. And so salvation is how I'm going to get to heaven. But just because I'm going to heaven don't mean I'm going to live free on this earth. And it is possible that you're on your way to heaven but having a miserable existence on your way there. Because even though you are saved, you are still bound. Oh, we're going to tell the truth today. It is possible to be set, just because you say, don't mean you're good with money. Just because you say, don't mean you know how to use a credit card. That, no, it is possible to be saved and just be swiping happy and swiping your whole life away and in the debt up to your ears. Just because you say, don't mean you can't break the law and still go to jail. Just because you say it don't mean you have to pay child support. I'm saved now. I don't pay child support. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. Child support, I'm, I know God. Okay, you're going to know God and these payments. Just because you're free don't mean you don't struggle with addictions. Just because you're free don't mean alcohol. You don't smell the ah, 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 alcohol and be like, ha, 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 ha. It is possible to be saved and still be a bad parent. It is possible to be saved and a horrible at relationship. Just horrible. Yep, you got all the Jesus. You know how to say hakuna matata, matata, hakuna matata, matata, matata. But you, you still, nobody wants to date you. Because you know Jesus, but you're bound. You know Jesus, but you're mean. You know Jesus, but you're still in pain from something in your past that you have not recovered from, and you are trying to church it out, but you can't church it out. You're going to have to get free. 
Oh, I know I'm talking to somebody. I'm stepping on somebody's toe. We're going to keep on going. What I want for you is freedom. To not have to look over your shoulder while you're living on this earth. To not have to struggle with pain your entire life. To get you to a place where you're finally free, where you can worship God. For some of you, the music ain't what stop you from worshiping God. It's you're bound. You are bound and in a prison. You can't lift up your hand regardless what the song is. You're never going to be lifted. You got to get free to lift your hands. You got to get free to open up your mouth. You got to get free to worship God. You got to get free. Look at somebody say, get free. It is God's will for your life that you will be free. Oh, that's why I read Mark chapter 3. Please don't forget about the dude I read about. Jesus is sitting here in a synagogue. When he gets to the synagogue, he sees this dude with a withered hand. Now, Jesus is looking at the dude with the withered hand saying, ooh, 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 okay, okay. I see an opportunity for me to move in somebody's life. I see an opportunity for me to go ahead and touch somebody. What's happening are there's some Pharisees around, and the Pharisees are watching Jesus. Now, they're watching Jesus because at this point, they're trying to figure out how to get rid of him. For everybody who would say if Jesus were here, I would just hug him and love him and kiss him. And that's not what happened when he came to earth. There was a whole bunch of people who were tired of Jesus, sick of Jesus, and so they're watching Jesus trying to catch him up because Jesus says he's with God. So they're saying if Jesus is really with God, is he going to heal that man on a Sabbath? He going to heal that man? Uh, so they're, they're taking notes so that they can have something to accuse Jesus with later on. Meanwhile, Jesus is like, y'all looking at me, but what about this dude struggling? So you saying, I can't help this dude. So Jesus is getting angered because these are people who don't know why they're supposed to be here. They don't know what the word is for. They don't know what this is about. They don't. So he's mad because y'all are trying to judge me instead of trying to help this man. And this brings me to my first point. Already, I got to my first point. Take out your pen. Take out your phone. Write this down so we all get it in our spirit. Church is a hospital for broken people, not a museum for perfect people. Church is a place where we help people. It's, it's not about the music, y'all. It's not about whether we shout, whether we clap on the one and the three or the two and the four. It is about are we helping people? The heart of God is that as a church, we care about people. And we care about what people are going through. Please, this is not about your clothes and who's wearing a suit and who's wearing sneakers and who got a tattoo and who got an earring and who smell like weed and who smell like blood. No, no, this is about at some point you got to walk through these doors and say, number one, I came to get some help. And number two, I came to help somebody else. Yeah. But this is a place for hurting, broken people to come and meet God. Oh, when the Bible says, why did Jesus see this man? You know why Jesus saw this man? It was his withered hand that attracted Jesus to him. Oh, I'm going to mess you up. Do you know that it's not your perfection that attracted Jesus to you? It was not your suit that attracted Jesus to you. It was not your cologne or your perfume that attracted Jesus to you. You know what attracted Jesus to you? When he saw your life needed his help and you needed him to lift you up, all of a sudden God put his eyes on you. The reason why God put his hand on you is because he saw you dying. He saw you in a pit. He saw you needing help. He saw you needing strength. And God actually was more attracted to your brokenness than your wholeness. I got to teach that for people who feel like I'm too messed up to come to church. Oh, I hear this all the time, Pastor. I'm going to come to church. As soon as I get my life together, I'm going to come to church. That's like saying, I'm going to get in the shower as soon as I wash up. No, 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 no. You get in the shower to get clean. You get in dirty. You, you get in broken. You come into church every week with your broken self. Come into church every week with your hurting self. Come into church every week. Come on in this room. Lift up your broken hands. Lift Lift up your broken praise because God's going to stop by your seat. Yeah, God's going to stop by your row. God's going to stop by your house. I know you came in looking embarrassed about what's going on with you, but you don't got to be embarrassed. God says, I got my hand on your life. 
God is attracted to the broken pastor. No, God is attracted to the church person. He's attracted to the perfect person. He's attracted to, by the way, uh, if you want to see a perfect person, go to a museum. They're called statues. They sit there. They don't do nothing. They don't talk. They don't say nothing. They don't move. They, they don't even need a group. Lanisha, they don't need a group. Statues are just perfect the way they are. But I am telling you, if you come in here, it's a hospital for broken people. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, 19. Jesus says these words. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the rich. No, the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the free. No, the captives. Recovery of sight to those who can see. No, those who are blind. To set at liberty those who are good? No, those who are oppressed. Jesus said the people I'm looking for are the poor, the captives, the prisoners, those who are spiritually blind, physically blind, oppressed. Jesus said that's the group I'm looking for, which means if you come to a church, you're going to find broken people. I, I think we got the best church on our planet. I really love this church. Thank you. That's a good place. Thank you. Thank you, Z. Somebody's like, I'm sick of this church. I do not think that. I'm so sorry. But, but just be, when you come to church, it is possible to have a wrong expectation of what the people in church are supposed to be like. We have this idea that when you come to church, everyone's smiling and everyone just loves each other really much and everyone just had a really good day and Everyone just came in and said, wow, God bless you, and, and you took my parking spot, but it's okay, I forgive you. <laughs> and you was walking slow in front of me, but it's the joy of the Lord is my strength. And you're sitting next to me, and I'm just, you're bumping me, but it's fine, because I've got God. No! No, y'all fooled me on launch day, but it's nine months in. <laughs> At our church, there are people that God's still working on. Is there any money in the room that can admit there's an area of my life that God is still working on? Which means when you come to church, you might meet somebody a little mean. When you come to church, you might meet somebody who's a little rude. When you come to church, you might meet somebody with an ego as big as Texas. When you come to church, there are people, yes, somebody might smell like some of the weed. <laughs> yes. Every week I go home high in the spirit. <laughs> and I go home a little. Because there was an aroma. They said, Pastor, how you doing? I said, I'll tell you what's up, man. What's going on? I just want to hug you, Pastor. I'm like, oh, God. They always want to hug you, like, Pastor, I want to hug you, man. I'm just like, all right, man. <laughs> I got to teach this because the enemy uses us against one another. So that when I come to church expecting to see godly people and I meet broken people instead, all they got to do is one thing to get on my nerves and I can use that as the means to say I'm never coming back again. But the enemy just used that person because they tried to use him or her to keep you away from the destiny that God has for you. But you got to stop letting the enemy play you and say, I came here for a reason. I came here for a purpose. And yes, it's a hospital. Some people cough. Some people sneeze. Some people got a fever. But I came in here to get myself together. By the way, you got an area of your life God still works. Can you cut it out? Matthew chapter 7, verse 5. Write this verse down. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly take the speck out of your brother's eye. Stop acting like there ain't something about you that stank a little bit. Everybody got a little ha-ha-ha. <laughs> and... Including me. Yes. God's still working on me. There's still some areas of my life that the Lord is still, you know, working on. Uh, I, I'm a, I, I figure sometime if I throw myself under a bus, you'll lay down too. So uh, I, recently I was, went to Chipotle. 
And uh, when I got to Chipotle, I said, yeah, can I get a chicken burrito, please? And uh, the dude behind the counter, he said, uh, uh, we ain't got no chicken. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean we ain't got no chicken? <laughs> we, we ain't got no chicken. I said, yeah, but, but I see chicken on the sign. If chicken's on the sign, then that means you should have chicken somewhere. No, no chicken here. And I'm like, come on, man, come on. Dude, I came here for a chicken burrito. Why, just take the chicken off. Why, why make me think you got chicken? You should have had a sign on the outside door. There is no chicken here. Had I seen the sign, I would have kept on going. But you made me think there was chicken here. You're trying to tell me there's no chicken in the back. No, there's no chicken in the back, man. Come on, man. Dude, it's, I'm about, like, come on. So there's no, so I'm supposed to eat beef? I'm supposed to eat steak? I don't want steak. I want chicken. Come on, man. Why, why, where's, what kind of management is this? That y'all ran out of chicken. So that means y'all don't order enough chicken? You don't order enough chicken. So we need a manager to order enough chicken. Okay, you got to order some chicken. This is crazy. This is, you know what, forget it. Just give me the vegetable thing, and I'll just do that. So he starts making the vegetable thing, and I want some uh, mild, mild salsa. Oh, we don't have any mild salsa. <laughs> you don't got no mild salsa. So you don't got no chicken or no mild salsa. This is a true story. You don't, so, are you kidding me? So, why you got mouth salsa on the side if there ain't no mouth salsa here? Dude, like, dude, man. So, I can't get no chicken or no salsa. That's crazy. You know what, man? Whatever, man. Just, just, give, me, just give it to me. He wrapped the thing up, gave it to me, and I started walking back. He said, oh, by the way, Pastor, I love your service, man. You changed my life. <laughs> God bless you, my son. How are you? The Lord is good. He's, he's wonderful, isn't he? We don't care about chicken. Because <laughs> God still working on me. So you got to get to a space where you can admit that. Here's what's crazy, though. And the, the text tells us that his hand was restored. Restored mean it used to be good, but then it got withered. The text tells us that he had a hand, then it got withered, but it don't tell us how it got that way. We don't know if his father did that. We don't know if he was working and an accident did that. We don't know if he caught some sickness and it did that. The, the Bible is very clear and meticulous. Every detail matters. And the scripture don't say you don't need to know in order to see him and want him to get some help. Some of the people that you see are mean. You might be talking about them, but you don't know how they got that way. You have no idea for the most of her life. She has been rejected for how she looks. She has been thrown away by every person that come into contact with her. And she has one interaction with you in a parking lot at a church. And she snapped at you, but what she was really snapping at is a series of people in her life who cut her off her entire life. And here you are. You done ran away from church because you came into contact with a person who's broken in an area that ain't got nothing to do with you. I have learned as a pastor of this church that majority of the conversations I'm having ain't got nothing to do with me. This is some who's fighting a demon from their past they are fighting a hurt from three other churches they ain't got nothing to do with me they are fighting something from four different relationships of somebody who kind of look like me and so now I'm hurt because of something that you did but it ain't you I understand they smoke weed they shouldn't smoke weed but can I tell you something you have no idea the abuse that person may have been going through you have no idea what their father said to them you have no idea that the only time they drink is the only peace they ever get because if they're ever sober they almost will lose their mind I feel like I gotta get some alcohol in me in order to not be and see all the stuff that's happening in my world. What I'm saying to you is that some people are broken for a reason. And behind every fruit of anger is a root of brokenness. And we are dealing with the fruit and kicking people out because of the fruit, but we got to get to the root. But here's what I love about the text. The text says that Jesus goes up to the man 
And Jesus is so savage, Jesus tells the man, hey, stretch your hand out. Now, you got to understand, it takes faith for this man to do this because he's probably hiding his hand. He probably don't want nobody to see his hand. He probably got his hand in a space where I don't, don't want to draw no attention to it. Jesus said, no, I need you to stretch your hand out because I'm getting ready to fix your hand. Here's my second point. Just because you are broken doesn't mean you get to stay broken. Just because, so, some of y'all were so happy at that first point. Yeah, pastor. <laughs> Tell them, I cuss people out because I got cussed out. <laughs> That's right. I drink because I'm stressed. That's right, pastor. Tell them, leave me alone. <laughs> Only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. Hear me. I understand what you're saying. But just because you came in like that don't mean you got to leave like that. Just because you are broken, at some point, we're going to have to deal with your hand. At some point, you're going to have to show us the broken area, and you're going to have to let us work on it. At some point, you're going to have to have some faith to say, hey, here's where the pain is. Here's where I'm hurting. I understand you mean, because everybody's mean to you, but it's been 20 years. You're just going to keep that meanness forever? All right, I understand. He broke your heart, but that was about 30 years ago. You're not going to move on. You're not going to get past this point. You're going to stay broken forever. There are some people who have made brokenness part of their identity. And escaping brokenness and getting into freedom it puts them in a foreign place that makes them uncomfortable. I don't know if you've ever met somebody who spent a long time in jail. They will tell you they have more fear coming out than going in. Because I'm used to prison. I'm, I'm used to being ran by somebody. Now that there's freedom and I've got this new freedom, I'm nervous and I'm scared because I've never been free before. And so many people, you, have, you, you use your addiction as a pillow that gives you rest. You use your brokenness as a blanket to comfort you. And you come into our church and we try to take that pillow and take that blanket so you can get up on your feet and get free. And you almost, you almost strike us upside the head because we touched it with it hand. And I am saying that you got to be a person that says, hey, here's my with hand because I'm telling you, God will not let you stay like that. Pastor, prove that. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Don't tell me all this stuff. You know, Jesus, how deep you are if you've been spending your whole life not free. Because if Jesus show up, there should be some freedom. You can, you, you, you can quote all the Bible verses you want. I know how much Jesus you have by the freedom you walk in. You can go ahead and give me all your church attendance and tell me that you was under bishop so-and-so and you was under reverend so-and-so. Show me your freedom card. Don't show me your titles. Show me, show me where you got free. Because your freedom tells me that the spirit of the Lord was active in your life. And I meet too many Christians who don't have the spirit because they don't have no freedom. You're not free, you're not free to laugh. You're not free to, you're not free to smile. You're not free in your mind, cannot sleep. And you are walking around bound, and I am telling you that the Lord wants you to be free. What? Why would that guy have a hard time showing his hand? Because it's embarrassing. And almost there's shame connected to showing people my weakness. Most people do not let you in on where they're weak because of the shame that's attached to it. And I'd rather appear like I have it together than to let you in and let you know where I'm struggling. I, I remember when my daughter was first born, uh, uh, it was my first child, and so uh, my, wife, my wife was just, you know, always with, with the baby, and, and I used to tell my wife, I said, hey, I, I can take care of, I'll take care of her. Why don't you go out? And she used to kind of say, uh, no, you're going to have a hard time doing this, and I'm one of those dudes that you can't say I can't do something because then I'm going to go crazy and go over the top. I'm like, yes, I can. I got it. And she'd be like, no, no, you probably need my help. And I was one of those dudes that was like, look, I, 
I can hold the baby and go grocery shopping and go, you know, I would come home and be like, you know, you didn't cook yet? Girl, I, if I was home with the kid, I would have cooked, cleaned, and had the baby to sleep, and I was just, just, just losing my mind. <laughs> and so I said, girl, you, go, you, you do your thing. Go. I, I got the baby today. You just go. She's like, you sure? I said, go, girl, go. And for me, I, I, I'm going to prove to her that I ain't no punk. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to prove to her <laughs> that I'm a man. So I got my daughter with me, and I mean 10 minutes, 10 minutes after she left, my daughter, I don't know if y'all ever seen Chucky, but my daughter, <laughs> I hope you didn't see Chucky, but if you did, my daughter, you ever seen the Gremlins, like the Gremlins, that's back in the day? My daughter was like, <laughs> I was like, who is this child? And so I'm sitting here like, man. Uh, uh, let me, I'm trying to, you know, shake her, I'm trying to rock her, I'm trying to feed her, trying to burp her, trying to do all kind of stuff. I was, I was reading, you know, reading books, and they were saying blowing her ear hard, like, you know, like, I was just doing all kind of stuff. I was trying to recreate the, the, the you know, the noise she heard in the womb, like, I was just making up noises and doing all that stuff. I was doing all that stuff. It was bad. But I decided, I decided I'm not going to call my wife. So I called her mom. I called my mom. I called everybody's mom. I knocked on neighbor's door. I was like, hey, I got a baby in here. I got it. And I'm telling, I'm fighting like crazy to not call my wife. And then I broke down. And I said, babe, can you come home? <laughs> Many of you in this room, you have an area of your life that's screaming. And you know you need help with it. But because you don't want to be embarrassed, you keep pretending in front like everything's okay. But at some point, you're going to have to get in a group. At some point, you're going to have to admit, I'm struggling. At some point, you're going to have to pull somebody to the side and say, hey, I don't do well in this area of my life. Here is my withered hand. Can you help me with this hand? And I promise God's going to show up. James 5, verse 16, it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Healed. Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I am telling you that when you lean on one another, when you lean on one another, it allows you to walk into a space where God can work on you. <laughs> Musicians, y'all come out. I'm getting ready to close this, but something the Lord just said to me. Uh, some people say, Pastor, why does it feel like God's picking on me, though? It feel like God keep pick, pick, picking, pick, pick, picking. Because John chapter 15 says that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he throws away. But every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why does he prune it? So it can be even more fruitful. What I'm saying to you is that the reason why God picks on you sometimes, you know what pruning is? It means to cut. Sometimes God cuts at your life because you are a fruitful person. And he knows to take you from one level of fruitfulness to the next level. He's got to cut some stuff. So part of the reason why you come to church and we start cutting at that relationship. Cut, cut, cut. Cut, cut. Is because he's pruning you. Because there's more fruit in there and you can be even more fruitful. If you're in this room and we start cutting at your finances, cut, cut, it's because God wants you to bear more fruit and become even more fruitful. If you are in this room and it feels like God is picking on you, maybe the reason that God is picking on you is because he knows your potential. He knows what's on the inside of you. He knows what you're capable of. He knows what you're called to. He knows what you can really do. And I'm telling you, it will change and transform your life. Okay, musicians are here, which means it's time to go. Can uh, Y'all got some out of this work? Did y'all get some out of this? Okay. All right. I got one more thing. I got one more thing to say. I got, I got one more thing to say. I saw something in the text that just slapped me right upside the head. I saw something in the text that made me go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I saw something in the text that made me want to do a cartwheel, wanted to make me jump all over the place. Can I show y'all what I saw in the text? It was, it kind of messed me up. It, let me, I, I know I showed you in Mark, but let me show you this in Matthew, because Matthew had the same account. And uh, Matthew said, 
in the verse, chapter 12, verse 13, it says that he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored. But here's what messed me up. This last part is just as sound as the other. Keep that up there. Okay. That made me want to go crazy. That made me want to go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. L let me see if I can say it again. It says that he completely restored his hand. And that the hand after it was completely restored, it was just as sound as the other. Yeah, that, yeah, that, I, yeah you should have slapped your neighbor. You should have high five five people. You should have went crazy. We're going to do a class on when to shout. I'm going to teach everybody on when to, <laughs> when to shout. I'm going I'm to just do a whole class on when to shout. Let me, let me see if I can do it again. It says that, that he, the hand that was withered became completely restored so that it was just as sound or as whole as the other. Oh, we're getting better at this. Pastor, why is that a place to shout? Because it means if you ever met this man after he got restored, you would have never known that his hand was messed up in the first place. Because here's my third point. When God restores you, he will restore you back like you never left. I came to preach to somebody in the room. Part of your problem is that God restored you almost too well. Because your broken hand don't look broken no more. So when you try to tell somebody, you know my hand used to be withered, people don't even believe it. Because when he restored it, he restored it back like it never left. Okay, here's why you should go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Because many of you in this room, we don't know who you used to be. Because you don't look like what you've been through. I can't tell you used to be a drug dealer. I can't tell you used to be depressed. I can't tell you used to be suicidal. I can't tell you've been divorced three times. Because when I see you, all I see is the whole you. Well, what happened? What happened was I was jacked up and I was messed up and I was broken. But when he restored me, he brought me back like I never left. Do I got anybody in this room that can testify? I don't look like the depression that I've been through. I don't look like the abuse that I went through. You couldn't tell my hand was with it, but it used to be with it. I used to be homeless. I used to eat out of trash cans. I used to give my body to anybody, but God got a hold of me and he restored me so much that I don't even recognize who I am. Can I get somebody in the room to open up your mouth and say he'll put you back like you never left? Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Somebody say yes. Say yes. Yes. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. God, God, that's why, that's why. You remember we used to have testimony service? We had to get rid of testimony service because people are crazy. And people start testifying about stuff that ain't really a testimony and start gossiping and telling Uncle Deacon so-and-so's business. But can we do a quick testimony service real quick? Just, I just need eyes, eyes witnesses on. If God has done any of these things for you, I need you to raise your hand. You're going to testify. You're going to, don't do it yet. You're going to do it yet. Don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. Don't do it yet. But has God ever paid a bill you didn't think could ever get paid? Has God ever stretched your money farther than you know it should have been? Has God ever restored you from suicidal thoughts? Have God ever healed your body when the doctor said, this is the end, this is final for you, but somehow you live past the age they told you you was going to live? Has God ever healed you of a broken heart? You didn't know how you was going to survive what you went through? Has God ever made a way out of no way? Has God ever picked you up off the street? You was in the gutter most. You was out there in the hood, but God pulled you out. Has God ever kept your body, kept your mind, kept your spirit, kept your heart? Can I get somebody to testify and said he did it for me, Pastor? He picked me up. He turned me around and he placed my feet on a solid ground. Somebody shouting, yes, yes. Yes, yes, won't he make a way, won't he pick you up, 
won't he change your life won't he set you free won't he pull you out of a pit won't he take you out of a mess won't he grab your life somebody somebody open up your mouth and give him what he deserves he deserves my praise he deserves my worship he deserves my shelter he deserves it let me give you one more scripture and then we out of here one more scripture one more scripture i'm so over time this is crazy one o'clock's gonna be backed up uh, but i got one more scripture y'all remember the story of the three hebrew boys and y'all remember they threw them in the fire and remember that that fire was seven times harder than it was supposed to be can i tell you what the scripture said when they got out the fire Daniel chapter 3, verse 27. It says, Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around the three Hebrew boys and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. Okay, we're going to go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs right here. And they didn't even smell what you mean you was homeless what you mean you used to be crazy what you mean you ain't been in church your whole life what you mean you've been divorced before what you mean you had low self-esteem what you mean you used to be shot you don't smell like you don't smell like the fire that you came out of because God will bring you back like you never left her. Somebody open up your mouth and say, God, restore me back. Put my marriage back like it never left. Put my kids back like they never left. Put my ministry back like it never left. Some of you wasted 10 years of your life doing stupid stuff with stupid people, spending money on nothing. But God's about to bring it back like you never left her. God's about to bring you back like you never left. Open up your mouth. Oh. See you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see to again. You made a way without no way. And I believe, hey, I've seen you, I've seen you, I've seen you move the mountains. I believe I'm a seal to it. You made a way where there was no one. And I believe I'm a seal to do it again, again. I'm going to see you do it again. All right, I need everybody sitting down. Union, I know you long enough to know that while many of you are in the spirit, some of you are thinking about that parking lot. You're trying to figure out how can I get ahead of everybody else. By the way, know that we be trying to work on that light. I know that's a long light out there. We trying to talk to the county, the city, to everybody to help us get somebody out there. We working on it. But I got to get some people saved right now. And so here's my guarantee to you. If you give me the next four minutes, I can get some people to Jesus. I can get us all to give to the Lord. And I can get us all to get out of here at the same time. If you're here under the sound of my voice, and you know for a fact that those tears that are in your eyes and that stirring that's in your stomach is because God wants you to come home. God wants you to stop running. God wants you to get your life to him so that you can experience true freedom in your life. In this moment, I'm going to lead you into a prayer. And this prayer is going to be a prayer. It's going to shift your life. I want everybody to pray it together. Say, Father... Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. I give my life to you. 
I repent today as an act of my will. I turn from the practice of wrongdoing and I give my life over to you. I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he was risen from the dead and I believe he has all power in his hand. I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, let everybody say.